Okay. These very strange units which are housing and which, thanks very much, which, which, sorry, <laughs> sorry for this. Um, which are housing, but you never tell that if you look at, simply look at it this way, there's no, I, no way to tell what they're for, what the scale is, how many floors there are. There's no sense whatever what the function is. There's something timeless, really. They like time. They look like tombs more than anything else. They seem or or ruins, which of course is what he is is his original inspiration. And they have these wonderful enigmatic cuts in them that don't seem to have any particular scale, but are all related to big circles, as you can see. And when you look inside, you really can't quite see what's there. You just barely see up above there's a doorway that opens onto a little balcony. But it's all very mysterious. And remember how Rossi treated this. I'll talk about Rossi later, of course, but he did one wonderful thing. He took a brick stack. It was rectangular, but it was like this. And like these, they were really derived from Roman ruins. And he put a tomb inside it. And um, that tomb was on the upper level. You entered the tomb from down below. You see, you went down these stairs into the earth. And the sarcophagus, the bodies were down there. There's a dark cross. And up above, almost unattainable. And I think you could get into it from the first level, but it wasn't encouraged. and no way to see it. It's as if he had the whole uh, facade of heaven, as if he transcended earth. And what it really is, is a version of the great Roman gate at Verona in North Italy, of course, which is where Rossi comes from. It's as if classical architecture is the facade of heaven. And we're down here in the earth, down below. And Kahn, in a curious way, though he's constantly using Roman architecture, he will never use Roman details. He always has to give the impression, not to those who were close to him because they knew better, but to the public at large and to most of his clients, that like all modern architects, he was making it all up, making it all up out of his head. He just couldn't face the fact that he, in fact, worked this way. And there are a lot of critics, foreign critics and so on, hate to believe that Kahn worked this way. But as you can see, and I think it's been perfectly clear to you, that's what he does. He adapts the ruins of Rome. And it's a great group you have here around this great body of water, this Indian tank, with these enigmatic red presences around this equally enigmatic strange structure in the middle, which looks precious compared to them. It's of concrete, but it has those fillets of, of uh, 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 marble, like some precious material going through them. And often that marble, you can even see it from here, sometimes that marble is popped out of the little slot. It all looks handmade. But it looks strange, it looks precious, but it too, inside, will only go this far to classicism. Rossi, you see, will go the whole way, but Kahn will only just indicate the pediments the tondi, the circular openings, and so on. And that's just no further. That's it. I mean, to, to continue Kahn's Jewish references, which are so important, it's almost like Moses, it's always seemed to me, who led a whole generation toward the Holy Land, but he never enters it himself. It's really like that with Kahn. He can't break through. And he, what he does like, of course, always, what he's always inspired by, is Piranesi. If you look at one of these uh, carchery by Piranesi, one of the very few where the wall seems to be thin, like this, and then you're looking back up through those strange places, those stairs and so on. It's almost exactly like that in those spaces around the high court, around the assembly uh, building uh, at Dhaka. It's funny about this slide. I published it also at Caltech when I was teaching there one year. They would not believe that this was the right way up. They, when they published it, I told them over and over again, but when they published it, it turned upside down. I don't know, it's something about an engineer's eye or something. And they had to have that upside down, even though you could see. I kept saying, but those are, those are lights up there. Those are lamp and so on, lamps. And they'd say, no, they turn upside down. So anyway, but, but it looks that way. I mean, it has no up, no down. You're disoriented. It's all that violence and strangeness that's in Piranesi. Khan wants it too. He wants the sublime. He wants awe and terror. Now, so much of that work was done on the subcontinent where he didn't need glass. And when he came back, when he's working in his last years in America, 
he tried to work in the same way. Uh, the wonderful Kimball Art Museum, which is right down at the foot of the hill from the from the from uh, 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 Johnson's earlier art center in Fort Worth, at the top of the hill. Just down below, you see you don't see any glass. There is a glass wall back in there behind those little trees, and he plants that little bunch of trees like little tiny trees like Botticelli or somebody to mask the glass so he won't see it back there. And actually you can trace that from uh, Rowan's at Hadrian's Villa. And then inside it's the same thing. It's form and design. The first form he has for those arches, for those vaults, where he wants to get perfect, in his view, perfect reflection of light coming down below. The first one is a Roman half vault. And then to get the light better from his point of view, he deforms it. That's form and design, as I talked about before. The process of design bombards form with the specific functions of the thing, the specific actualities. So that's, that's the way he makes it. And then when he does Exeter, the library at, at, at Exeter School, he won't even let you see it's a building. He makes each wall stand up as if it were part of a ruin. There is glass down below, but it's stuck way back, so you hardly see it. Up above, he lets you see that the wall is hollow. He won't connect them at the corners. He makes a perfect square, as if he's just drawing it, or as if it's a ruin. And then inside it, for those three stories that you can see there, which are the main part of the library, he has a big concrete sort of frame inside, which is then opened out in each of the four interior walls of that courtyard inside, or that in interior court hall inside, into a big circle. So it's a perfect circle in a square. I mean, it's a, it's a, a diagram. It's perfect, abstract, circle in the square, and, and a ruin. And you see the way he handles the glass, as, as minimal as can be, as little as he can get. When he can, he, he likes rather, rather have oak panels, as you can see there, with tiny little slots of glass in them. And then up above, to show that the glass is not really important, you have the open voids. Now that's why it's so strange his very last building that he didn't complete even before he died, had to be completed by Marshall Myers, one of his people, is one in which he uses glass splendidly. And this is the Mellon Center for British Art at Yale University. And it's right across the street, Chapel Street, from uh, his earlier art gallery, that I'll show you again in a minute. And here he goes away from all that. The original proposal he made for this building was more like uh, Exeter. That is, it was concrete and brick, and it clearly was uh, inspired by the ruins, and you could hardly see any glass. Then all of a sudden he stops it. He has to change it, he has to make it smaller. When he does, all of a sudden he has a different scheme, and he makes a frame system, a base system, as you can see there, of columns and slabs and beams, very perfectly clear base system. And then he brings glass, and uh, stainless steel, which he treats buff. It, it doesn't shine like stainless steel, it's buff. It looks like slate or something. It looks like polished slate. Glass and slate right up to it with no window reveals, no sun breaking. So the glass is right on the surface and really explodes its reflections thereby. No shadows cast on it. The light just explodes in it and the glass really comes alive. And here's this man that had avoided glass he saw it from the very earliest drawings he was doing and loved the ruins because they didn't have any glass. Here, he has a different scheme. And it's really almost like Mies. It's almost as if he picks up the Mies scheme. We have a frame and infilling panels which are both solid and glass. But again, Mies has a lot more mullions and things chopping up the glass. And he has also uh, uh, screens right behind it so the glass doesn't reflect at all the other way it does in Kahn. Everything about Kahn is to make that glass uh, really come alive. Also, as I said before, especially when you get to three stories with Mies, you wonder about the structure where you get those little intermediate steel sections going up in between the brick. You wonder here it's hitting that big uh, horizontal uh, element there. It doesn't look right structurally, but Kahn's does. You really feel the point load, and then it's beautifully made concrete, and he's got a little expansion joint, a little joint between each one. And you really feel the load being held there. Now again, too, like the building across the street, he wouldn't design an entrance. He just cuts the end of the building out and cuts out indeed a column, or where you think there ought to be a column. There isn't down below in the frame, but nevertheless, 
column above comes down and he beefs up that great big element, that structural element, that girder there on the first floor, and that enables him to do what the students demanded, and it was a help to him in the end, they demanded there be shops for the New Haveners on the first floor, so you didn't just have um, the institutional closing off of the sidewalk. And then, of course, that gave him a base, and so he welcomed it. And so you get a really classical, it's really very classic, it goes back to the Bibliotheque saint Genoyev, it goes back to Schinkel, and it's very much as we've already seen Mies. On the other hand, it's still Kahn, it's still the sublime. When something wrong with the light. How can I get less light in this place? Never, I never seem able to... Good. Good, that's better in anyway. Oh, that's a lot better. Yeah, that's when you go in under that sort of threatened hollow at the corner of the building, with the big beams crossing above your head, you come into this space, which is the hall. And he wants this, this is for British art. It doesn't look very British, the building, but he thinks of oak as being part of a, a paneling in a British house, a British great house. So he has oak paneling set in, in the frame. You can see it's all within the frame. And he gets away with that big open space by having uh, smoke detectors which will cause um, panels to come down, and they're dangerous. They come down like uh, guillotines in those hollows. So as soon as any smoke or any fire starts in there, the whole thing's closed off, so it can't go to the other floors. But you have to be very careful not to have your head sticking out uh, when that thing occurs. And then when you get farther along inside, there's a big sort of, what he thinks of as the great hall of an English house. And there you certainly get the sublime. And there are two enormous paintings of ferocious animal scenes by Stubbs. And then the stairwell is enclosed in this concrete you see that it's not structural, it's not, so it's like a being, some kind sort of creature in the space. You really do feel the sublime inside it. But what he wants most of all, when you get up there right in the corner, say, or in the upper level, where the light is very carefully studied coming down from skylights, in a square bay system, which is a continuation of the bay you see on the facade, it's where he says, I designed it so now so nobody can change it. Across the way, he had the big space frame, which was then changed immediately uh, after he, he left the job, as I told you. Now they can't do it, because the columns cut it up inside into square bays. And from that uh, window, right up there in the corner, you see all the buildings across the street. And it's touching because, of course, he designed the one in the middle, the art gallery. It's really his first important building of his whole life. And this is the last. And they're right across the street, shaping the street, as you can see, in relation to each other. And it's wonderful. It's, again, we have Descartes, and the angle of reflection being the same as the angle of sight. You see, you get the Swarthout building here, you get Kahn's building here, and you get Rudolph right down there at the end. And I said before, the Rudolph is who, whom Kahn wouldn't speak to because he, he interfered with the space inside that. It beautifully cites that building to contain the cutoff box of the Kahn building with that open gesture. And that's right on the axis of the sidewalk, right there. So it is, I think it's a grand group of buildings, and we're lucky to have it, and we're lucky to have two con buildings right there in the same place. But the early building across the way, his first one is the touching one. That's where he really struggled to work it out. And it's almost like the Bible, it's like Jacob wrestling with the angel. Uh, he, wrestles, he wrestles with Pharaoh, you remember, drawing those uh, pyramids, turning them into tetrahedrons, studying them in light and turning them into the light sources there of his slab. And one of his greatest drawings that I didn't show you before, you really feel how those great architects, who really the first great architects of Mediterranean civilization, they reach out to him, this little Jewish man, they reach out to him and they send him on his way. This man who had Episcopalian written in his passport so he could be visiting Egypt at that time in, in, uh, in 1951. Now, there are a whole class of con buildings that were never built. I talked to you about one before, the Mikveh Israel Synagogue. And he couldn't build it really because he couldn't figure out how to finish, how to put windows in it. I talked to you about that. Now, there's an even greater synagogue, which you can see deriving right from Egypt here. And that's the Herva Synagogue in Jerusalem. He did for that great mayor of Jerusalem, Teddy Kollek, and which was never built. And he went through two or three studies. 
The first study which we have here is the best. There's a man named Kent Larson who has published a book of a virtual reality with the computer. He brings these con buildings back through the computer. And you really feel you're inside one of them. Here you're inside Herba, and it may seem strange. I'll try to explain it as well as I can. But you can see, you have the pyramidal thing, and they have the lights. See that black light? See that white light? Only shapes like that. It's that light. And that's science he talks about. Now, what we're looking at through there are four big piers, which are piers. Uh, each one coming down into four, so you can walk through it. See one, two, that's three, four, you see them here. And then above it, the slab goes out like that. And almost touches, but not quite touches, these vertical uh, slanting, really slabs, which form the facade of the building. And that facade, you can see in this model, they're Egyptian pila here. Right there, he takes it right from Egypt. The whole shape of the building, the square, the blocked off square, is Mesopotamian, in Palestine, Near East, uh, ancient East, that's the shape of the, of the temples in that, in, that, in that area. But you see inside these slabs don't right, quite reach. And they don't, and, so, and the point is, how are you going to put glass in there? And he could never work it out. Anything you do ruins it. You can see that, you can study it over and over again. As soon as you get glass in there, you ruin the whole thing. Because in a curious way, it's not a building. It's a collection of ruins. And it's too bad in a way it couldn't be built that way. Exposed to the air and so on as it is. With the blazing light of, of Palestine outside. And the cold winters. And the people gathered as in the desert. Jewish people, when they talk about uh, Judaism, always talk about their pastoral phase. Uh, what happened in the desert was so important for them, shaping the whole thing. And it could have been wonderful. It's, it's, and it's unfortunate it was never built. The way you see it, you see how great it would have been. There's the Dome of the Rock. There it is. There's your square, blocky. But also Egypt, right there, out of Egypt. And then uh, this, of course, is all Roman and Islam, with the domes, I mean. The whole dome is it. Islamic development from Roman architecture, and that is uh, Near East. That's uh, uh, Hebrew and uh, Ur as well. And, and again, Khan, like Corbusier, was, and you see the inside, the inside has, has more terror than most of his other interiors, really, because of course he's dealing with Jehovah, who's a much more terrifying god than any of those of Rome or Greece, much more demanding. Would have been wonderful, really. And great for him, but it's just unfortunate. Now he, of course, like Corbusier, who bases himself on the Acropolis of Athens, where here's Khan down here in the other sacred city of Jerusalem, here, is part of a heroic generation, even though Khan is a little younger. His whole intention is this heroic kind of architecture. And we found that to be useful only up to a point, as we've already seen with Corbusier. And the architect who was closest to Khan, to whom Khan owed a lot, which he begrudged acknowledging, uh, is totally different from him in intention, and that's Robert Venturi. And I think Robert Venturi, though I don't think he's understood anymore by most of the new urbanists, I've heard some of them give really slandering talks about him, he really starts the whole process out of which the new urbanism comes because his architecture from the very beginning is not concerned with the individual building as a monument, but with the building in the city. Somehow he always has a sense of its relationship to the street, to the place. I think I can show you that. So out of that, that word that the neo modernists hate so much, uh, con context comes. But it's more than that. It's not just wanting to be like the buildings that are around it. It wants it to be part of and in relation to the basic fabric of the city to, out of which it grows and which is supposed to augment. So he calls himself what none of the others would ever have called themselves. He calls himself a mannerist. And he says he likes mannerist architecture. And he's thinking of something like uh, uh, this Roman uh, palazzo of the early 16th century, uh, Palazzo Massimo alle Colonne, and which is adjusted to the slight turn of the street right there. And the columns open up a little bit to feel the twist as you come out in this, and the things up come, come tight so you can feel the walls stretched. And they change the scale, 
and so on, by Peruzzi. And this he loves, this building. He went to Rome, and he went to Rome very soon after World War uh, II, still in the 40s, in the very late 40s. He managed to get abroad, and he went to Rome. He came back, and he worked for Kahn for only about six months, but it was a very fertile period, and they kept in close touch thereafter. They always conferred with each other uh, thereafter. So he's interested in the city, the city street, and not in the heroic expression, but in an anti-heroic sense of, of just making what's there a little bit better on its own terms. And for that, believe me, the modernists hated him, and that, that hate started which the new urbanists have now inherited at the present time because it cut up all the ideas, you see, of so many modern architects on which they've been, which they've been taught in school, that they were the great heroes, the makers, the shakers, the heroic uh, figures standing out, the public didn't understand them, the builder couldn't build it, so on and so on and so on, all kinds of nonsense, and along with a contempt uh, for the traditional city. Venturi brings it all back and he inherits all the dislike that comes along with it. Now, his first building, really his guild house here, um, designed in 1960 and not, not finished until 1965. And it's on a common, as you can see, a common street in Philadelphia. And it's so different from Kahn. You see how close it is to Kahn. You see, like Kahn, you have the wall with the slits in it and the arch in it, right? And the frame behind it or in relation to it, but how different they are. Cons, first of all, are nowhere, as it were, no place, as it were, ideal place, all by themselves, making their own campus, way off in India. And it's not a facade they make, really. It's a wonderful take on the Indian method of cutting the plane across and then cutting back in. Not, nothing there except the stairs and the hall. But Venturi is giving you a sign like this, which I'll talk about more in a moment, because that brings us to the next thing about Venturi, which the first thing is context. And the second thing is sign and symbol, the resurrection of the use of symbol in architecture, of sign, of a building as a, an informational device, as a semiological device. Uh, this is, again, all Venturi. Now, you see it, he wants it to be part of this common street in Philadelphia, and he doesn't, the way Wright, I've already showed you some of this before, Wright in the Guggenheim, you see, uses the buildings that are there so he can be different from them. He used them as a frame. Venturi draws from them the suggestions for his own form. He makes it just a little more special with the big arch and the big gesture up, up through the middle. So when he says, as he does, Main Street is almost all right, he means exactly that. You can make it better, but its terms are okay. It makes sense. You don't have to outrage them. And again, I mean, this is that view of Lexington, Kentucky in the 1940s or whatever that I showed you before, but he's working around out of the same tradition that Sullivan worked out of. When Sullivan designed his banks in relation to those towns, Venturi is basically picking up that local caring about the individual urban situation in every building. Now, he does a lot of things that are very old-fashioned. For example, when you look at it from the side, you see that he draws a kind of string course it goes right through a window there on the next to top floor to give the building a kind of top. Now that's an old device. You find that over and over again in our cities. Wright used it in the Charnley House, for example, uh, in 1890. But Venturi then does it, though, with a twist. He says, you see, uh, this isn't really anything inside. I, so I put it in an arbitrary place, cutting right across a window, where it makes no sense. It's only to give that top a sense of stopping, a sense of capital, a sense of completion up there. And it does do that. And then the other thing is the window. Now, to say a window, a square window in a wall is unusual. It is. I mean, Matt Kahn doesn't design a single window. I haven't shown you one. Not a window. He says he may bring glass to the surface, as he did in the, in the in Mellon Center, but he has solids and he has voids. And that's the typical thing. That's that. You don't design windows. And one didn't in monumental architecture at that time. But imagine Corbusier and all those people at that time. But what he can do, he just takes a square, puts that dumb, as he called it, cross monument in it, and then he plays with it. And to me, when I saw this building, which is Guildhouse, of course, and I saw it in Philadelphia, Robert Stern 
made me go, it took me down there. I really felt I was in the presence of an architect of, of stature that I hadn't seen before when I saw these windows, more than anything else. Because you really feel the great apses, uh, 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 the, 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 the rhythm of, uh, uh, of the voice, the squares that are slightly different sizes, and also using the uh, uh, air conditioning ducts as part of it. And then against that in the middle, right in the center, this great signboard. And here's where the, the, the sign and the symbol comes in, because in every way, he wants this building to attract our attention and to say something and to provoke a reaction. For example, you see Khan, Khan is just the opposite. Khan wants us to feel a structural drama. And as I say, it's not a facade. We're introduced to arches which seem to be held together in enormous tension by uh, concrete ties like that. That's what he's interested in. Look at the concrete frame in Venturi's. There's the frame, and he says the brick is outside it. It passes it. It just gestures like that. This is not a gesture. This is a tense clutch inside like it. It's like that. You really feel it speak. <laughs> the semiology, the history of the science of signs, this is all sign. Now, the other way he gets it, too, is take the Karl Marx off, we talked about before. This could provoke a reaction, not only by this great red defiance of these shapes, but also by the name. Just Karl Marx off is enough to send the right wing into hysterics and the left wing into ecstasy. He, he can't do that. So he does two things. He puts up an abstract piece of sculpture up on top, that's all it is, and he calls it a television aerial. Now there is a television aerial that's hidden back behind the chimney, but this is not one. And if it had been a Bauhaus building, Gropi has been doing it, they would say this abstract piece of sculpture by the great Hungarian sculptor so-and-so, and everybody would say, oh yes, art and architecture, that's good. You people like art to be with architecture so long as it doesn't mean anything. But here, it says, what, our old folks watch television? And that's the common room right underneath it. And I remember one critic saying, how, how dare he, dare him? And when um, Dick Lee, the mayor of New Haven, asked Khan if he should employ Venturi, Khan said, I wouldn't trust an architect who would crown his building with a television area. He couldn't resist it. But it's not a television area. But, it, but aesthetically, he doesn't have the social program to drive anybody crazy. What's wrong? Oh, no. Do you have an extra bulb? Somebody kicked the thing out. Sounds like the bulb. That's too bad. Don't you have a bulb? This is the first problem we've had this year. At Yale, I would have had one like this every lecture at least, or worse. So I can't complain. But it's oh so sad. I could describe all the right hand slides without seeing them. <laughs> okay. We may as well relax. Uh, 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 so you see the point? He, he can't say, if he puts Karl Marx up on his building, everybody would laugh. I mean, who cares? I mean, it's, it's, it's no, no point at all. But he puts this television area, people react. So he's making do in a time where that social conflict is not there. He doesn't have that deeply serious program. He makes a joke, and people hated that too. But it's the way he invoked a response. Now, the same thing is true of Guildhouse, remember. He is able to say Guildhouse an enormous size. And that drove everybody crazy too, because the people who hired him, the, the, the planners and so on in Philadelphia, they want a guild house to be a neat little thing just the size of a brick down below, big one. So the Romans made them big, he makes it big. Now the other thing, remember that thing, so it's always the same one, so you can remember it. It must be imprinted on your brains by this time. So you do have the guild house. But then you have more than that. You have that big black column out there in front of the entrance. It's hard to get in. I remember, we remember Furnace, this great Philadelphia architect of the 60s and 70s, uh, making it difficult to get in the building. There's a pillar right in front. You've got to force your way into it. Well, he gives you some sense of that, but he also gives you a sense of a lot of other things because there's a great big pillar down here by the cleric. And then he is also picking up expressionist architecture again, where the cleric is giving us this locomotive coming at us, bright red and dark down below. He's picking that up as well. 
or even more if you remember that Venturi facade, you must remember it. Good for you, Rene. Thank you very much. You can even go back to a painting of 1652 by, by Vermeer in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam of a street in Delft. Look, remember the, remember the Venturi, the flat brick with the slits and the black column, and here it's a black door, but it's the same, and the red and the white. And it's just that somehow the whole thing, I talked about condensation before, some of the greatest architecture seems to be condensation of opposite things. These are things that are just in his mind somehow. Because he, he knows, he remembers, he's a good historian from that point of view. I hope you're careful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll hope for the best. Does nobody know how to put it? We should be prepared for all emergencies. See, fool's paradise. I was looking at a fool's paradise. I thought we'd never have any trouble. <laughs> well, I'll keep going on. But it's mostly like this. Like, what he's really re doing is reviving that use of sign and symbol, which had been such an important part of modern architecture when the Russians got at it, when they were trying to sell the revolution. I talked about this before. And this great thing by Lisinski, beat the whites with the red wedge. He has none of that social program. He doesn't interested in it. He's interested aesthetically how he can key up the building. So there's the red, there's the white, there's the big guild house, there's the annoying uh, television aerial up there. He brings all this back. So he's enormously enriching the vocabulary of architecture. I remember right at that period, in the early 60s, everybody was talking about semiology, the, the science of signs. Everybody was talking about uh, uh, communication and language, and that's what he's embodying there in his building. Can't you get it? He got it? Good for you. It's all right, you're fine. Now, at that same time, good, thank you, magnificent. Thanks very much. Uh, well, anyway, you've seen that over and over again. And he even has a little windows in it, as they do in the, in the Karl Marx house. So it's full of people. But the big gesture is up above for the common room, like this. Now, he then, he then went further, and he designed a building which is really almost all sign. And this is a little fire station in Columbus, Indiana. Now, you know, there's a man named Miller in Columbus who wanted to have a, a museum of architecture. So instead of having a wonderful plan worked out for the whole thing, he did try to get outstanding buildings by a lot of different architects. And he has one here by Venturi. And you see what he does? He, he, sa he says, I'm going to show, and it's on a kind of fast street out here. He says, I have a structurous red brick, and I have big doorway openings over there for the fire engines, and I have medium-sized ones for the firemen coming in and out, and I have a little day room, and I have a place where they sleep. And each of those has a different fenestration. Now, that's all red brick. But across that, I'll have white brick, which picks up and then gestures up to the top where it tells you that this is number four. And then you see how he cuts the building back behind it. So the whole building is really, is really like a sign. Now, directly after that, and I'm not talking, of course, I haven't mentioned his book, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture of 1966, because you're reading that but you can see the relations of his work to it. But then in 1972, he writes with his uh, wife, Denise Scott Brown, he writes Learning from Las Vegas, and with a lot of architectural students that he got together and took out there with him. And he showed how signs like this in Las Vegas were really organized, make a lot of sense from a great distance from an automobile. A great distance, you see Aladdin. You get closer, and this comes into uh, focus. You park, and that's right there, outside your windshield. And then all this he shows as, as the strip. And, he, and then everybody seems to think that, that you know, that's where, but that comes first. He designs the sign before he's interested in the sign. And his own works, his own signs, don't look like that at all. But they really look like Russian constructivism, as we've already seen. Very clear, very abstract. See, it's wonderful the way he cuts across the functional shapes with this pure gesture which is the white brick. That's why it cuts across the window, cuts across the door. 
and said, this is noble number four, this is doughty number four, it's ready to go out and do battle with, with the flames. Now out of this, he gets a whole system of the building as an operational device, an informational device, which he pushes toward electronics, which he pushes toward the way he can do it with animated facades, with lights, with, with uh, television, with laser, with all kinds of mechanical devices, which nobody had paid any attention to before. And few people have exploded since, but he keeps working on it all the time. And he does a project for the National Collegiate Football Hall of Fame, like this. And this is gonna be, he calls it a building board. And it's a board, big one, which would be electronically worked out so you could show anything you wanted on it, like a great television screen. And it's in front of a pool which reflects it. And it's right near a big road and the cars come in and the diagonal, it's kind of wonderful, you see, and they park like this. So it's really like an outdoor theater too. And then behind it, you have a comparatively small museum and then seats going down to a football field where you can have an exhibition game if you like. And this can be small because the exhibitions there are laser. And they're in your space. Uh, have you ever seen lasers where conjure figures out? You've seen them. Really, one of the conjure whole figures out next to you, through you, around you. It's really great. And these are all these are different famous plays, famous runs, longest run in the, in the uh, study, and so on. And so, it, and, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept it in that because it wasn't genteel enough. And they want something that looked like a temple, and that's what they got. It looks terrible, but. Uh, doesn't look as bad as the pro one, Canton, Ohio, which is indescribable. But this was really tr pretty terrific. And, but they didn't like it. It was, it was much too vulgar, really. Well, this is for signs, this is for the strip. You can't have buildings like this. And actually, it was in the idea, it was uh, uh, both uh, 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 Rogers uh, and Piano were going to complete the Pompidou Center with a big screen like this right here. And as, instead of seeing all of it as that tinker toy part of it, that archigram part, a good part of it was gonna be screen. But it was cost, gonna cost a lot of money, they finally cut it in the final thing, but they've often acknowledged that they were sorry that they weren't able to use a Venturi's invention, they said, uh, in it. Now there's more to it than that though. Uh, it comes on to, it would have been wonderful in some places they lost the Whitehall Ferry competition of the 1990s. And if it had been built, it would have been there just barely before the towers were struck. And you can imagine what, they had a big facade, there are the ferry slips, you see the three of them. Then they had this big facade which could be activated in any way they wanted with electronics. And sometimes they did, like this was a great big American flag. And you can remember how striking that would have been at that scale especially in those days, those fevered days after 9-11. I mean, it would have meant a lot right there. But again, uh, he had, they had all kinds of trouble. They aren't easy to get along with as a firm to work with because I think firms like that who really are thinking of new things uh, are often difficult. There's no doubt about that. Khan was difficult and uh, he is too. And I don't, think that's a, I don't think that's a virtue. I think they should try not to be difficult. But nevertheless, they lost this, which is, I think, too bad. Also, I mean, uh, people don't like it, you see, because people are genteel. One of the worst things in the world is people want to be genteel. They want to think. And so if, if you say the Big Apple would be a good symbol for Times Square, everybody says, oh, how vulgar. You wouldn't possibly do that. That's not art. But it is art. And I mean, it's like, it's pop art maybe, but it's art. It would have been really terrific, the size of that thing. Really wonderful, and then look at the whole vision. I mean, some of those dumb buildings that were being proposed by Johnson behind, but then the whole thing glows with that magical light with the big, big apple down there. But again, still, he's one of the few architectural firms to this day who in a funny way is too advanced for the public. On the other hand, he also limits himself partly by this preoccupation with the sign. Sometimes too much, the decorated shed he talks about. Let the building be just this and have a big sign. But whatever the case, he hasn't been building as many as he should have, though he has a lot of work. Now, more than that is the other side of him where he's always thinking about the city, a side of contextuality. And here is a really wonderful example of it. 
It's a Brighton Beach project, housing project of 1969, 1968 to 1970. And it's really a wonderful, the way he gets it is really wonderful. The beach is right here. It's on the beach. The, the road behind the beach is here. There are pre-existing buildings there and a bunch of small ones here which are torn down. He puts the new ones in so that everybody in one of these things has a diagonal view of the beach and to the sea beyond it. But it hardly interrupts the view of the people behind. I mean, look how there's air all around it. Okay. And at the, uh, at the competition, it was a competition, people like Philip Johnson said, oh, that just looks like any old building you might see around New York. And one fellow said, it reminds me of Hoboken where I was born. I've been trying to forget Hoboken all my life. It's, it's part of people pretend to gentility. It's wrong. You get that in Florida. People go to the University of Florida, someplace like that. They're taught, the kids are taught that their hometowns were ridiculous. It's high art. That's, that's deadly. Same way here. And this is what he's fought, fought all the time. Wonderful, pure, logical plan. A year later, when Johnson had gotten the word, and Johnson, as I said before, he was a very fast follower. Johnson, when he was trying to do something for one of his projects, he said, I want this to look like any old apartment group around here. So he'd go down, but it was too late here. It's interesting, the one they chose. See, the one they chose was very genteel. It had all the proper things in it. It had, it had a Corbusier. It had the Maison de Salut. That's all Maison de Salut, a Corbusier right there. It has Khan, diagonals, you see. Khan there. And it, look what they did, block all those guys, absolutely airless, like a ha! You can feel that. Architecture is space between things, and they really feel that. And uh, it was not built because it turned out to be ridiculous, and they never built it. I don't know what they ever did build on the site, but neither of these things. Now there's another one he lost too, for the, exactly the same reason, because he's thinking about the, the city. And the city happened to be Washington, D.C., an important one. And it was for the so-called Constitution Square office building. This was a big developer's thing, and he hired Venturi. And of course, the most important building there is right down the end of the streets, the Capitol, right there. And there's a pre-existing office building here. So he wants his building, as much as possible, to come up to the street, to echo as much as possible that one, and to direct the eye down it like this. On the other hand, he wants this place to be full of life, which is supposed to be, so he has a shopping street behind there, like that. You see it? And we're back in, so it has this fenestration out there, and then you're back in under there, and it has this lively thing. Now, it had to go up, it, the developer loved it, it was all set, but the Washington Fine Arts Commission wouldn't pass it. And it was, it was under um, Gordon Bunshaft, who did Lever House, who destroyed Park Avenue. And uh, uh, this is what it was going to look like. And you see, there's that thing up here, and it goes back in. Here's the back end, right? and that's the thing like this. The bunch of said at the hearing, said, no, no, buildings have to stand by themselves, a lot of space around them. And the hearing was, it was recorded. And Denise Scott Brown, his wife, who was very difficult to shut up when she starts talking, you can hear her in the background saying things about bunch of, and bunch of is saying, can nobody quiet that woman? <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so they kept pushing him and pushing him, and the developer was getting, running out of time, running out of money. Oh no, 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 no. It's gone again. It's gone. This time I can't, I live. What happened is, it sounds like the bulb again. Good. What happened? Okay, watch it. Be very nice. Be very gentle. And he uh, and Venturi said, "Well, Alvar Aalto did this in his pension building in Helsinki." And Venturi is one of the architects who learned a lot from Aalto. I'm sorry, I don't have time to talk about Aalto in this class, but he's a great architect in, in Finland, as you know. And Venturi learned a lot about him. And it goes back. The main street is out here. The building comes out and comes back into an inner court, sort of like that. And Bunchaff says, you don't have any right to talk about a great architect, Mr. Venturi. You have no right to mention Alvaro. Like so finally, Venturi, under constant pressure, did something as close to the building, standing by itself with a lot of space all around as he could, 
but he tried to pick up the street with the trees. He tried to echo the building in the ground plan. It's really fascinating. Yeah. But by this time, the, the developer was out of money and they had to quit it. So again, he really was he's suffering from everything that the neuralism now takes for granted, which is the fact that it should really be contextual with the whole relation of the street, the city, and the whole place. Not just a building by itself with a lot of space around it, as, as, uh, as Bunchev said. Now, he lost another one at Yale, but he really won it. He won a camp competition, but then the donor died, and his estate would not honor the gift, and there wasn't enough money, and it couldn't be built. But this is in addition to the mathematics building, and it's right on Hillhouse Avenue, which I've shown you many times before, and it's just about here, turning like that, looking down this way. It's right about there. No, that, no, that house is there. just back about where we're sitting. It's right about here. It's perfect. And this gives you a pretty good idea, uh, even more than you see it here. Uh, Hill House Avenue goes down and goes up. So it's not just a question here. Here it's on top of the hill. It's not just a, if he continues it out like this, as this building does, it just have a blank facade out here. But, so he turns it to look up the street and to preserve this Hill House. So you can see it here, and you see it there, which, is, which is right there. It's really wonderful, simple. And there were hundreds of entries and it was a unanimous choice of a great big jury. And it was all, uh, you know, anonymous. See, here is this building you see on the left, University Health. And he opens like a door to look up that famous street. And there's the building you saw in that picture a moment ago. This way he saves that building. And there's a railroad track that goes through underneath here. He just barely steps across. It's really wonderful, very elegant. Just steps across. So the whole thing turn, takes off from the older building and turns and looks up the street. And that's all. Just like that. But it makes a gate. The, the, the uh, sciences are basically up the hill and the humanities are down the hill. It's kind of a gate between the two parts of the university. And the plan, you can see how much he's learned from Corbusier as well as from Alto. That's my, very much an Alto gesture. But this, this hall, look at this hall. Column standing out in it. It's so Corbusier that he's using that hall for a lot. It's so simple. Oh, like it. And then the library goes up two stories. There's a big cross mullion in it. And of course, that gives you a terrific view of this great big thing. But you know, what in heaven's name is happening to that machine? Do you, is, do you have the, do you have the uh, fan on? Fan on. Fans on? Yeah. Good. I'm just afraid it's burning. Why is it doing that? That's not good. Anyway, you see, it's taller than the original building, so he darkens that part. And it doesn't make it disappear, but it makes you see that that's a different part that has a different appear. I don't like that. You sure that fan's working, huh? Okay. Okay. Now, so that wonderful contextual building was not built at Yale, but was built where it really ought to be. At, one like it was built at, at Princeton. And this is Wu Hall that you've seen before. And Ventura, of course, went to Princeton while well, it was still a Beaux-Arts school. I remember going down there once with uh, Barnes from the GSD, and I was a snotty young modernist too, and we were laughing at the Beaux-Arts guys down there and how important the historians were and the juries and all that. And of course, they had the last laugh, really, or did for a long, a long time, uh, because really Venturi comes right out of that. And so he, has no, he feels no guilt about inflecting his building to get along with buildings that were built in the 20s. And that's what Wu Hall does. You remember I described it to you before. But I'll remind you that it's very much a modern building. You see the columns back here and lack of bearing on the wall. Great big impost box, but on the flat. Everything's very, what the point is, is pre-existing buildings on the left, Tudorish. And then this, this pedestrian path through the campus comes this way. He takes that path with a terrific velocity. The front of that building is flat like that. At the same time, it gets along with what's there and makes a space that's a little better than the space was before, but doesn't outrage the other. The building itself, as you can see in there, it, uh, has a wonderful plan which expresses that facade like that. And then you have that long common dining room, which you saw there behind the columns. And it goes up to the end to the staircase, which completes the whole thing and turns into a theater. And then completes that hemicycle, Tudor's hemicycle on the other side, 
the great big outskate balls like that. And then you see partway down there, opposite the doorway between the two pre-existing buildings, you get this thing, it's totally different, like a signboard, black and white, stood up there. Wow, big in scale, right over the entrance, clearly a sign. And again, it reminds us, I'm sure he's thinking of Louis Kahn at Dhaka. There are those shapes in the wall, the circles and the triangles and so on. And he's picking them up and putting them here. And there's a one note right opposite the entrance there in this building, which otherwise complements the existing building on the site. So here, context is more important than style. And the whole city, we might call it, the whole campus, is more important than just the individual building. Now remember how he works that. Therefore, all the style that architects have been working on, honing their special styles, all become a little ridiculous because you really need a different one for every place. And that's, again, they couldn't uh, forgive that because one of the great tenets of modernism was you, you had a special personal style, which had no connection with the past. And so when he does this Institute of, of uh, 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 Information in uh, Philadelphia about 1979, it's actually earlier than this was about 1980, you see it's totally different. You have Corbusier windows, but you have a computer printout as decoration. You get a very bold, use of a kind of signboard going in like that and a, and a cantilever like this, but you see it's in a different place. Fast street, pre-existing international style buildings, velocity of the place, so it's not the style, it can't be Tudor like the other one, it's uh, Corbusier, as it were. And then also classic revivals we saw at the Sainsbury Wing of the National Gallery in London where he revives a whole panoply of classical architecture, but uses it in a very free and, uh, and very gestural way, as we'll see. Now, this is a wonderful thing that's worth studying in some detail. Of course, it's on Trafalgar Square, and the main big building is, is a building of the 1840s. The museum is right here. And St. Martin's in the Fields is right there. And the Nelson Column is out there, so it's the heart of London. And here is his addition, and you see what he, so very in the simplest way, he picks it up to pick that movement from St. Martin's in the Fields, bring it right down here. Now I'll talk all about that later. What I'd like to talk about first is the building itself. You see what you do, first of all, it's reminded of Khan. He puts pure voids, he puts pure voids in it. But it's layering, it's ruins around buildings, and actually he's doing this before Khan. He does it with his, some of his own projects of the 50s, and I'm sure Khan gets it from him. Khan does it in a very different way. Nevertheless, you see, it's also like, uh, it, it, it's also like Lutchens. Lutchens will do that too. You get an entrance, there's no glass, the real entrance behind it. So you go, this, here you have nothing in here, They're like cuts on a ruin, like this. Notice a little column start down here, but I'll talk about that later. So they pull you in, and you get into that space, now, I was lucky enough to be in that space. You can see as you, you pull in like that, it's really great, cavernous. This, pull into that space, and the space itself is pretty wonderful. And I said I was there when it was open finally. I think it had been closed for about five years. And there are people there who hadn't seen their favorite paintings, so some of the greatest paintings in the world are here. And they hadn't seen their favorite paintings in five years. And I waited here, and I, there's some kid came in rushed for the stairs, and I followed him. And I'll show you later the painting. He went right to it, home to it, right, to it, right looking to that painting. But you see, you look through glass in that wall beyond the stairs toward the old building, which is connected only farther back, as you see there. And then down below those stairs, which are going, uh, are going up as they rise. On the other side, you look down, because there's a lot down in the ba in basement too, and there he uses a Lutchens device of enormous classical uh, freezes, just hurtling there down the stairs. On the other side, when you get above it, going up above it, the other side, it's glass open to the original building, and you look up to the place of the second floor, the major floor, where you have the connection with the old building. And there was supposed to be an inscription up there, but they can never decide what to say in it. So up to now, there's no inscription. They've, just got, they've got nothing there. They don't want to put a work of art there because they feel it's too exposed. So what they're going to do, we don't know. But as you go up there, you go past a level, 
there, a very low floor, where there's a, a number of services and shops and cafeteria and so on. The main building is in there, the new one. He lets them, again, layered behind the glass. They let them have glass there too, windows looking out. But it's right connected with the old building, like this. We're looking up there, and there's the connection with the old building. And the plan is really wonderful. You notice you come in from the old building, and you look down what is a, an increased perspective, false perspective, making you look farther and farther away to that painting down there at the end, like this. And it's wonderful as you go in here, you see, you go in here in each place, there's a cross axis. The first one has a cross axis, which has window glass like this. And it comes down to the, to the world's favorite painting right here, actually, as we'll see later. And then you come here, and this is the major axis. And again, layered, he intended to have a window there, but they wouldn't let him put it in. And curators are always worried. So one day they let him have these. They're always worried about natural light. But he designed the wall so it could easily be broken through and the windows be put in, if possible. And then it comes down here to a tiny little place right here. He, he has these handled differently, but then it gets narrower right there because of the site. So it's a wonderful, expressive, but very, very simple use of all these spaces. The major one is this great false axis, and which he does by having the columns, of course, be slightly closer together and at an angle. And then it's wonderful, the columns are this gray stone, which is, as you know, Florentine limestone called by the Florentines Pietra Serena, the quiet stone. This is the stone that Brunelleschi used. And in San Lorenzo, Brunelleschi used it in this color, light gray, like gloves. He also used it tan, it has a tan phase, uh, in uh, Santo Spirito. But it's this kind that Venturi uses, but look how different they are from Brunelleschi's columns. Oh yeah, but the first thing I want to show is like the Scala Regia in the Vatican, where from the courtyard in the Vatican you go up to the Piano Nobile and it looks like heaven. The Pope stands up there, much farther away and higher than it really is. Same way here. It looks like that. I want to show you though how different it is from Brunelleschi's columns, which, which are very taut and slender, and which you hit, they ring like a, like a mis uh, steel section. It rings with tension. Venturi's wonderful, they're indolent and fat. They lean back into the walls so that they're tired. And as they do, they seem to open the wall. You see that? The way he details it. And they begin to plunge into the wall. Like that. See, that, those are freestanding, and the others are sunk in the wall, and they're pushing the wall back. Like this. Really wonderful. Making you feel that perspective even more. And when you get to that point, just about that, the cross axis opens in the main room to your left, and goes right down to where the window should have been. You see how there should be a window there. That would be just wonderful right there. It's that, this way, window right there. But he, he, he designs it to look like one of England's favorite galleries. That is the Dulwich Art Gallery in Dulwich, outside London, by Sir John Song of the very uh, early uh, 19th century. You see with the cove up above and the lighting, he details it much the same way. Like that. And when you get then off it to the left, in that first big, sequence of rooms. We have the big square openings. It's really if you took the Dulwich Gallery and then you expand it into an enormous scale like this. And the lighting is here, it's wonderful because it's all computerized. And so that as it gets brighter outside, the lighting inside dims. As it gets darker outside, the lighting inside, well, I guess that's fairly normal, but it seemed remarkable to me. So there's a wonderful light uh, control despite the windows, which they were, but it's wonderful to have the windows because that means you don't feel, as you do in all most museums, that you're just in a sort of institution, but you're in a palace. You're in a palace like Urbino, really, like, uh, like the Palazzo Ducale in Urbino by Lorana. You feel you're in a place like that with the Florentine detailing and the stone and so on. And on that side, that room that I shed you goes down, this is the picture that the that kid was after, which is the great Piero della Francesca. Uh, Baptism of Christ, right down there. The other one, that little room I showed you where it comes down like that, comes down to a tight little painting, and there they just get the arch rooms like this, tiny. And they pick up the painting. It's really marvelous. Now the British architects, of course, hated this. Hated it. 
and many of them were my former friends, and they stopped talking to me. Really, I mean, even they'd start before people like uh, Jim Sterling and so on began to write about Venturi. They went mad with hate. They really did. They couldn't forgive him his context and his jokes and his love of the past, which he uses, because English modern architecture basically underneath wants to be socialist. That is to say, it wants to, in a certain way, it wants to f destroy the past. They hate it. They, that, that was, the prince was the perfect antagonist for them. They hated the prince, especially as a prince. And uh, they made fun of him in ways you'd think were libelous, whatever the case. Uh, and you've you got to destroy it. You mustn't play with it. You can't play its game. That's really what they think. That's why they're destroying London. All those people I knew so well, like Rogers and, and Foster, and so that's what they're doing. And that's why. And But they're especially angry about the outside, as you can imagine. Now, the way the outside got to be the way it was is kind of interesting. You see, it's right next to the, the, the building here of the 40s. And it goes down, however, this is a building that was built in the 18th century by Kent, before this one, in the 1840s. And it goes down there to St. Martin's in the fields, and you can see how they relate to each other. This building by Kent, kind of wonderful, it's really in a way more like Venturi's would have been because it's, it's a kind of sort of postmodern itself, or the pre-modern, when he's sort of learning, you get the feeling he's learning about classical architecture, how to do it, so got kind of crudity. Nobody's ever much like the big building by Smirk. No, not by Smirk, whatever his name, I forgot. I'll come to him in a minute. Here, it's, it seems very low. In a, a European square, that would look awfully low, but in England, that's more the English scale. And the best thing about it, probably, are those, is the colossal order of columns and pilasters. And that's what Venturi picks up, right here, at the end. Now, it's interesting to see how that developed. Looking right the same way in all these views, we got what happened right after the war. As you know, the Luftwaffe uh, bombed that site. And as soon as they got the money together, they, they wanted to rebuild it after the war. And uh, look what they did. These were the two highest ranking ones. One, and it's typical of that period, one said, I can't deal with this. Back in there. Someone says, I'm in charge here. And he comes pushing it. Look at, imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine they're going to ride him out of town on the rail. So, you know, they said, well, it wasn't, they knew it wasn't quite right, either one, either way. So they got a little more confident. They had another competition. And it got a big glass facade, and great big thing sticking out there, that thing. That didn't win, but I think the one that most of the architects like best was this, by Rogers, Archigram. Crazy. Imagine that, hey, right there, imagine that. Maybe you like it, I don't know. But anyway, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it that way, I suppose. But they, they all decided that was too much. And they, the composite thing that finally won it was this one, which is really idiotically complicated. Look at them at complicating the levels. Look at this relationship. Look at that. But they thought it wasn't fancy enough, so they got this architect to add the thing that drove the prince crazy, finally. This thing. He designed it out of his own head. He got right down there and got his tracing paper and he designed this thing. And uh, this is where the prince uh, said it, like a carbuncle on the face of a beloved friend. He couldn't do it. They so they had a final competition. It was all which the people were invited and it had to be contextual. It had to get along with the existing building. Now it's interesting to see what they did here. Here's this guy, what's he doing? He can't handle the details, he can't handle it can't handle classical architecture, not at all. Here's one, where you might call context in reverse, where you make, by the drawing, you make your uh, new building look the way you want your old building. The, you make your old building look the way you want your new building to be. So he has this new building, this is, this is uh, Sterling. And he has this funny sort of Egyptian thing here, why, I don't know. And he kind of draws this as if these were like that. You see, they're not a bit like that. Here. And that's not contextual with that at all, really, here. But he couldn't get over, Jim could not get over losing that competition. He never stopped talking about it, never stopped redesigning it all the time. It was kind of tragic. And I think it was a contributing factor that led to his strange death and incompetent people in, in a hospital let him die. 
with all the things pulled out of him when they should have been taken care of. A very minor procedure. Anyway, but here's the one that a lot of people thought was the best. This was by Pei and uh, 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 Henry Cobb, mostly by Cobb. I think Stern always preferred this one because you see, it's really very classical. It's really very. It's more genteel than this. In a funny way, it's in a way more correct than this. But look at the plan. Look at it. Remember Venturi's plan. Look at that plan. You tell me what that's all about, or the relation to this. It's not bad, but Venturi is bolder. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted and amazed that they, like again, look at the difference in plan again. Let's see. So you just, first of all, there's the glass. And it starts off the old building, so you don't see it if you're coming down the street. Then it's here, and he starts off with what he calls the cadenza. And he takes the pilasters, the colossal pilasters of the pre-existing building, and he makes some music out of them. Oh, wait a minute. Look, they're much more delicate. He's much better at it than the old guy over there. Taking off. And they sort of wave goodbye. Like this. And then you come into this, you see, and as they do, you get a bunch of them, fewer, less. The window starts to disappear. It's all gone. Now you get the column calling to the column in the middle of the square. The window becomes a... Okay? Then it turns up the street and everything disappears. And it's fascinating. As you're walking along to go in here, there are no intermediate columns. You're pulled in. But as you go along... You see now. Yes, as you go to it, right here, see it? There's this funny little column. A little Egyptian blue, tiny little column, only big enough. And the uh, English critics went crazy about this. They said it looks as if they wanted in drunk from Carnaby Street, stuff like that. And the uh, critics say they call it post -modern, American postmodern slime. That's what they call that facade. And see, with the columns now, they become companions of you as you walk that way. See, they intermediate between you and the void. It's really marvelous. Yeah, watch it. See? They're wonderful little things. And that's the only thing. And obviously not structure. They're persons there, like the people. And then it comes down this street, and you see it just wonderfully just disappears into the street. Phew. And picks right up as you look that way. And one critic, one of the most sympathetic ones, said, oh, we would have been so happy to greet this American if he'd come in like a cowboy, if he'd come in with some guts riding and shooting. Oh, Christ, he did that when it was appropriate and where it was appropriate. Not here. You know, not here where it's like this. And what they miss, because they have absolutely no sense of context, it's against their religion. How strong that is. Watch that void shape the square. It's amazing. Look about a modern gesture. That's stronger than that thing that Rogers did up there gesticulating in the air. Now, of course, Venturi, caring about the city, also cares about it in its basic sense as not a special building like that or a special place, but of the type that you can make cities of. In other words, of generic architecture. And I talked to you about how really that's the basis of modern architecture in a sense. That's the uh, Marshall Field Warehouse is generic architecture. It's the uh, Palazzo Block, the Renaissance Palazzo Block, which I discussed with you, which, however, in its new guise, has an interior skeleton of, of uh, metal with a surface. And it's the surface, look at that surface, of a certain thickness that the architect designs. See it there? That's exactly what Venturi understands. What he tried to pick up. And in his first library, which he, uh, 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 laboratory building that he does from Princeton, right after Wu Hall, he shows you how the surface is only a certain thickness. But he lets you see that it has a thickness just the way Richardson does. And then the windows, unlike Richardson's, the windows are part of that surface, so they're kept small with heavy mullions so they don't lose the thickness of the wall. They're right there. They're part of that surface. And then you see the scientists can design it any way they like, generic architecture. You can use it for anything you want. And you design the surface. 
And you make the entrance rather marvelous just by that, by showing the surface separate from the void like this. And then with that surface, the same building, you can do all kinds of things. You can detach it, cut it through, pattern it differently, make it stand as a, as a, a element that just has a void in it. On the other side of this building, wait, see again, how wonderfully he, those facades of his have such velocity. They design a place like that. The other side, he detaches it again, changes the scale, do a lot. As he goes on, this is, a, this is the last one at Princeton, he in a way gets more conservative. He tends not to detach the surface that much, but he gets more and more confident. And the buildings begin to look more and more like t traditional buildings. That's the thing, that's the other thing that people don't like about it. They're really looking like everybody else is doing things that look they're about to fly or whatever. His look like traditional big buildings, big cubicle blocks standing out there in space, taking up the space, very bold, very powerful, but in a traditional mode. However, he sometimes does really marvelous things with them. This is an office building for Disney in Burbank. And you can see he takes, as it were, the clouds or whatever. And what you can do, since you only design the surface, you can do anything you like with it. So you do this, maybe. It's really a shell, picks up the clouds. And it's wonderful because it's looking right across, right there, and it's absolute opposite, which is Michael Gray's wonderful world, Disney uh, world building, another Disney building right across, where it's all up front with Daffy and Disney or whatever they are, with the seven dwarfs up there, like this. There's all that sculptural stuff and all that. But Venturi, you see, proposes just the opposite. Now what Venturi will often do, will take that and put it behind that. And if you're on a street where you can't cut it into it or you don't have any space to go back and you don't want to go back, you want to sweep the street, you can do exactly that. And he did it for his orchestra hall in Princeton. You have this facade right on the street, it's perfectly thin, but behind it is real Baroque stuff. Sorry, you can't see it better, but it's, you're looking right through. And so he lost this building because some idiot came along with money and said, I'll give you the money if you'll build a building by somebody who knows what one these should be like, which is should be set back from the street. It should have parking around it. You name it. It's the same thing bunch after the same before. And of course, it's ridiculous. And Venturi made this really very powerful. Look at it. Music on the street. What you can do is really beautiful, and then behind it, really in depth, and he can do it. You saw how can do, he did it at, in London. He had a whole class, a really Baroque world back then. Now he's always been bold, much bolder than people think. This wonderful building, the Département de la Haute Garonne in Toulouse, just finished in 99. You see the power of that. Two big way, um, uh, Wings of buildings going back to a big uh, glass building there, de defining and shaping that town. And again, with that surface, the freestanding column, casting the shadow, what's real, where are the levels, just very powerful. He was powerful too in all those domestic choices where I talked about before. He was strong to see the power in that building, to know what he could do with it, to know how it could be concentrated there with a his favorite building, the Villa Savoie, Petronese Square, so on, all of it there. He knew that he couldn't go after Frank Lloyd Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright like this, who could? But when Frank was like this, which was like what he was doing, he could pick it up. And he could pick up Louis Kahn with the circle and the square, and he could make the square just a little more horizontal and square, so he felt it push a little bit, and the circle not complete but broken, as if his mother, not the classical hero uh, of traditional, that traditional image, but his mother sitting there in the kitchen chair could break the mold. And indeed, she does break it because where Khan shows you that, uh, that beam holding it together, watch him break it, smush it like that. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Okay.